GIA. And uh, part of the process of that was interesting research. And there are two books that are particularly uh, important books for me. Um, one is, I think I mentioned this before, The Naked Voice by Stephen Smith. Um, Stephen, of course, is up at uh, Northwestern. And he's, he was at the University of Houston, Moore School of Music, as a voice teacher. And so that's one of the books. And the second one that I've uh, been doing a lot of reading in is a book called uh, What Every Senior Needs to Know About Their Body. It's put out by Plural uh, Publications as well. Uh, Stephen Smith's book is put out by Oxford University. And uh, the journey in this is that uh, when I was uh, first at my first college position at, at community college, I did a lot of recording projects. And I would sit and I would uh, do, uh, at this time we had the quarter inch tape and we would sit there and we would run across the heads and you'd listen to where to splice things and start to notice a couple things about consonants. And then as I began my journey in voice, I began to really talk a little more, learn a little bit more about consonants. Because as most of us know, we all spend our time on vowels. So let's kind of take you through this a little bit. Um, this is a longer presentation. I'm going to just kind of uh, try and take you through it. I've divided it into five areas. Um, and those five areas are basic principles of formation, importance of consonants, technical considerations for articulating, and consonants of music and music in the body. So the principles of formation come from this uh, Stephen Smith book that I've been talking about. Um, our, our job is to train the air to move, to move freely, to make sure that the breath is moving constantly. We know that the sound quality and longevity of the voice are more dependent upon the use of the voice and the way we use the voice than it is about the folds themselves. So in other words, it's more important how we use it than it is what God gave us to start with. Right? We all, I think, kind of understand that. It's not knowing, as a singer, what is going to happen. It's being able and clear to know that what we're doing and the parameters in which the action occurs, we need to be vulnerable. It needs to be spontaneous. It needs to be constant motion so that the air is constantly flowing and it's creating. In other words, that's why we've been talking in the world. That's what we talked about. How are we creating the warm-ups? Because if we do the same thing over in muscle memory continues, you know if they learn wrong pitch in the beginning, how hard it is to change it. Even when you know that you probably should have done that earlier on, there is this habit of knowing that you can't take it back. Once it's in that muscle memory, uh, uh, Robert Shaw talked about that. He talked about grooving a pitch and grooving an intonation. And so it's very important for us to have this creativity in everything we do. So your technique moves through time. It needs to seem natural. When we speak, we open our mouth, we talk. That's basically what you do in singing. So all of that stuff that I had in my voice lessons in my freshman year in college, all of that technique really was about building something that I wasn't, making me a health and tenor at 17 it was probably not the wisest thing that could have happened to me. And I was a very studious student, so I went to that practice room every morning, and I worked and I worked and did every exercise right, and guess what? At the end of it, I could barely film it. And that really took me on this part of this journey. We know um, that what we need to do when we sing and we also know that the lips are the best shapers of tone. Not what we do back in the back of the throat. Lifting the soft palate is something that we were all taught. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that that's not important. Lifting the soft palate. We you all lift your soft palate? Okay, I want you to now lift your soft palate as if you're a person with no experience. Back to the throat or stretch the pillars, right? All of that. 
Yet we don't use that. Truly, we speak. So that concept in itself is somewhat damaging in itself because that's when we get into these back ideas, this back concept of sound. And if you listen to the European choirs, Most of them are much more on um, full of resonance. If you listen to the, especially Eastern European choirs, you have a very brighter sound. Maybe too bright for us, but we color that a little bit with um, We talked a little bit about this with the warm ups, with N being the warm up of. different than when I was taught as a, as a young teacher and as a, as a singer. The reason the end works so well is because it's very little movement here, the jaw. I remember Van Christie. Do you remember that book, Van Christie? Is that what you Probably not. It was a voice class book. And he would show you positions of various vowels with the mouth shape. I have people who tell me, well, you need to put three fingers in your mouth. Well, I, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, my mouth is not that big. And that is very painful. So when I say put two fingers or three fingers in my mouth, depending on the shape of my mouth, I may or may not be able to do it. And it also attaches itself to tension in the mandibular joint, and the mandibular joint being the, the jaw muscle, right? Right here where the bones meet. So I want to avoid those things in my, in my teaching. And the ni ne ma na mo no nu, there's a tendency of just using the tongue to do most of that articulation, which keeps the tongue free and loose, which is one of the things you want to do. Um, these are the two resources. Um, and uh, plural has the one that every singer needs to know of the body. And again, these are on my website, jamichaelshaibi.org. Um, and then they can go So you can see all these presentations there if you find. The importance of consonants. This comes from Zen, I don't know if you know that. He was a, a speech pathologist. Um, he dealt well, of course, with William Bernard and others that I um, uh, really uh, admire. There's a young man, uh, Alan uh, Lane, who yeah, is who is a graduate of, uh, of uh, uh, University of Maryland. And he just recently graduated, graduated his dissertation is on the use of consonants in the choral rehearsal. It's a great resource as well. It's a pretty thick read, but it's a dissertation after all. Um, so what is, what is a consonant? It's an obstruction of the vocal tract. It's characterized by the place and manner of articulation. It can be voiced or unvoiced, right? And it's called a sonnet or a surge according to Bernard. And finally, it differs from vowels because there's noise. Noise. Consonants are noise. I love that comment. Um, it comprises 62% of all English sounds. 62% of all English sounds are noise. That's, that's wonderful. I love that. That means that in every syllable we sing in the English language, there's 1.5% or 1.5 consonants. How much is German? How much of German? Oh, it's higher. <laughs> or, or let's go to Czech. Yeah. Or you can go to a lot of the other languages, but we don't usually sing in our churches in those languages, right? I mean, not very often. But it's a really interesting statistic, and that's using some of the semi-vowels as being vowels, semi-vowels, right? So those sounds that are not, these are just the consonants. They carry more information. In other words, a consonant carries more information than a vowel. It's what tells us what we're speaking about. It is the important part. And the idea here is that consonants should bring out the vowel. In other words, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the consonant is making things happen in the vowel. We spend so much time, you know, with the vowels 
that it's really affected by the consonant. I mean, think about the language that we speak. Think of what speak is. That one word. Think about what those sounds are doing and how we have to articulate to make that happen. We can make sure that the consonants increase the intelligibility of a vowel. And that's something I hope we can point out. Huh. Choral vocalizations target proper vowel production. When you think about your warm ups, what are you worried about with vowels? Okay? They lack the careful consideration of the consonants. We need to be spending frock house on them. Ring a bell with them, but frock house on Do you remember her? She was this big German woman. She was brought in by Ray Robinson at Westminster Choir College, and Joe Plummer felt was brought in. And the reason she was brought in is because she was a voice specialist, and Joe was a great musician, but wasn't a voice builder. And so Ray knew that. Ray brought her in. She was a giant little woman, and she went around the country, and she did workshops. And she passed away probably a decade ago now. But she was one of the first of our vocal pedagogues to help with warm -up. So she would have you bark like a dog. She would have She do all of these types of exercises to deal with those consonants. And you notice where they all are. They're all forward. So much of them. Um, so we have to analyze the mechanism that produces the vowels and the consonants. We need to articulate with ease and energy and the secret in keeping the voice of development and equally to obtain in simple vocalization. I want to say simple again. We don't need those things that we did in our college voice lessons. We don't need an octave and a fifth and a twirl at the top and come down and sing it on an E that should have been modified somewhere along the line. Okay, so we don't need that. You may have remembered this. I don't know if you use this at all. This is the IPA chart. This is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And this is what we use in the symbolisms that we can use. And you can teach your choir certain ones. You don't have to teach them all. But if you give them a symbol, give them a sound, they'll have something they can use the rest of their life. So we can use this as one of the sounds for the average singer that we can bring in. I said that you can classify voices by vernacular speaking. By speaking, we talked about that yesterday. We talked about it in the case of a foreign student coming into a choir and knowing that in their language they may speak higher or lower than they speak in the English language. So if you have somebody move in that's from Korea or from China or from the Philippines, there may be a different speech level that they have, a speaking level, and that's really the best way for us to find out. Most of us are, are uh, how do I say this, damaged by the fact that if I'm a tenor, I talk lower. Our women today, our high school women and college women, they speak very low. They, they're down on the, what we call the fry levels, so they're down on the podcast. They think that that's really a good place to be, and it's a horrible place for the voice. And so I have to deal with that a lot, and it causes major problems for the students, and that's because the the emphasis today is on that in the, in the language that they have. So we want to always find out where your speaking level is. What is that speaking pitch? And that helps us tremendously. So we use the mother tongue. The first invention, invention should be uh, simply speaking simply. Start with the letter language because it's less entangled than singing. The minute we go to singing, if you go to some place like Korea and you work with Korean choirs, which I've had a, a wonderful experience of doing. It is uh, amazing the production that they're using. And they have very, very loud voices. But you're not going to be able to manage to do that song. You're not going to do a Renaissance song text. You're not going to do Bach well. You're not going to do some of the styles that we've heard in our, in our sessions here because it's just out of the box for them. They came through, so much of Korea was brought, um, when, when, you know, Korean choral music as such is about 50 years old in, in the Western European tradition. It came about because the missionaries went out there. The missionaries then converted the Koreans 
The Koreans then sent their church musicians to go to study. The only place at that time that they had a church program that they felt comfortable with was Westminster Choir College. And they studied in the old style. And if you know anything about John Finley Williamson, that's a very dark back production and a very loud production. So I think that that influenced what was going on somewhat in Korea. Side note, in Korea, ladies and gentlemen, all of the people that work in these churches, and I'm talking about the, con the, the churches of 100,000, the musicians are not paid. The church musicians do that because that's part of their faith journey. Is that scary or what? So they all have other jobs, and then they'll work in these congregations. Well, they may have two or three choirs of you know, 100 people that they sing for the services and the loose seven services. So just, just to kind of put some things in there about the Korea that was going on. Constance, interrupt with careful, we talked about that, use is for clarity. And we want to minimize the interruption of the airflow. That's a big point here. We want to get past that, that type of thing. I love forgiveness. This is a pulse. I don't know if you, I'm a cartoon person, you probably noticed by right now. Um, this is frictive. Say what? Frictive. That's my word for the day. I made a New Year's resolution to learn a new word every day. What does it mean? I don't know. It wasn't part of the resolution. So, <laughs> Fridges are really our friends because they help the music and the text transfer. So the fridges are the V's, the F's, the voice and the unvoiced, the Z's, the S's, the CH. Okay? All of those that interrupt the airflow with a loud air to go through. So, this is the way we grew airflow. Now I'm going back. If you remember my warm-ups, we're talking about airflow. Do you remember that? Okay. So this is the connection to the dots here. So H is the highest airflow. It takes the most air. And then goes down the line. Then you have voiceless fricatives. That one. Okay. And then you have the voice, a little more voice. Look. And they have higher degree of laryngeal tension. Laryngeal tension, right here, right? Glottal involvement. Semi-vowels, the M's, N's, N-G's. And this is where we talked, remember the warm-up, we talked about putting the breath here, having them feel underneath the nostril, the airflow. Do that again, do you remember that? Here we go. Mm -hmm. You'll always feel that air, and if you started, with the air ahead of the sound, you'll have an attack which is right on the pitch. Do it again here. Put a little air just through the nostril. Ready? Go. When we normally start the sound, this is where the, the connection of the breath goes. It's much better than. You hear that? And that's what I started to notice. So this goes back to 1978. Okay, that's where this started, this journey. Um, so we know that we have the laterals, the retroflex. We're not going to go through all of that. Um, but there's an increasing amount of air that doesn't flow, flow freely in as we go along. So we know that b, d, g are stops, right? B, D, G. So when I'm singing the word God, why don't you listen to that? God. Do you hear the pitch below? So now I've got to figure out how to get that sound to not sound quite like that. God. The only thing I did is I took the G, which is back here in production, and I moved it to the K spot. God. Does it still sound like God? No, but it doesn't have the same weight, does it? Listen again. God, God. I'm just moving the tongue forward more and I'm placing the G and changing the, to the, the K placement. And so I, the K has less interference because think about it. Ka, ka. There's still the airflow and the G has what we call the subglobal pitch. God. It's exaggerated, but it's there. So I can teach my choir to get this into the 
replacement of being more towards the K sound. Um, there's a, the P, the T, the K are problems. I use Italianate T's and D's. Do you know what Italianate T's and T's are? Those are the, the sounds which are called the, this tongue is more in use. So, the, 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 rather than the, the. So it's more tongue in that sound. So when you learn your 24 Italian art songs in, in, in uh, your voice lessons, here's where that applies. The, so if I'm going to go da, 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 here's the American D. Da, 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 or the, ta, ta. It's going to affect the vowel afterwards. So if I keep the air moving more and use what we call the dentalized sounds, these are dentalized T's and dentalized D's. That means there's air, the tongue is more by a hair, and the tongue is not as tight, and it allows breath to move. It's a real critical thing we can do to help our singers, and it helps us, especially the higher we go, if we've got sopranos and they have those consonants that are our consonants, we need to make adjustments. And here's one of the great places to make it. So I'm keeping that airflow, that same concept we talked about in warm-ups. So here's kind of a little chart. So if you look at, uh, this is where you want to be working towards in all of your singing. Because this continues to keep the air moving. The further it is over here, the less air there's going to be moving through the sound. And the idea is that you're singing on a ribbon of air. You know, we went to the gymnastics. Do you remember the Chinese dancers with the ribbons? I always use that as an analogy that I want to keep that ribbon constantly in flow with my choir. And that idea of keeping that constantly in flow as I'm singing or speaking gives me the air connection that allows this to happen in the phrasing and helps keep the voice moving as we do that. So this is kind of one of those really wonderful things. I think um, I updated this uh, last week, so it's not up on the website, but I'll get this one up uh, probably in a couple of days as soon as I get back to California. So here are some quick tricks. Mouth, lips, tongue, and jaw must be sufficiently subtle, 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 sorry. <laughs> it's early, guys, no coffee. Um, to provide the timing and movement. In other words, a lot of our singers are very tight right here when they're singing in our church choir. They get into this fixed position, you know, you've seen it, and they think it's going to take more. Our job is to make sure that they understand it really doesn't take as much effort here where we want it is here. We want the power set, the air to be moving. So we want to make sure that that continues to be free. We want to dentalize those consonants, the D's, the N's, the T's, the L's. The L's is an interesting one. Um, Peter Le who was one of the writers of the Rose Dictionary, did a presentation on madrigals with my choir um, back in probably two ago. Um, Peter Le Barre was a, a metal specialist. He wrote in that groves um, on this. And he talked about the difference between Americans and Italians and uh, the English with their L. So, of course, the follow up came about with manual talking. And we do, in the choirs that we have, is la 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 la, which is that right here. And he'd say the English would be either here, la 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 la, or here. Ha, la, 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 la. So where's the sound? Here. Now what do we know about that? That means that when I'm saying lore, and I'm putting the L here, lore, can you hear the pitch below? Lore. If I now take that L, I can use that as a warm-up. My tongue is right. At what I call the alveolar ridge, I don't know that that's the right term, but it says the thumb and teeth line. I can do warm ups that way. So 
it's just, what it's doing is that tongue is forward. Here's what happens when we do that back of the Lord, Lord. The tongue usually goes, Lord, goes up and then back down, which creates in the back, which is something we're always worried about, is it does create less resonance than the ability to have more resonance. The tube is closed. You bring the tongue back, what happens? You close up the passage in the back. Think about what that does. Okay? That's why that thing about sing with an open throat or put an A back there really doesn't work well. And that's that book that uh, the, the, whatever singer needs to know about their body, some great statements in there. Uh, we are trying and we're working towards minimum interference. Uh, there are some resources, I think they're on here for you. Are they? Yeah. Those sites, and I'm sorry, there's no way to link this. I can probably put the link. I think this is linked. The way this works uh, in, in my PowerPoint normally is it links to a, the, a site and you can actually go on to the site. So what we have is we have um, various different ways of listening to these sounds and seeing the sounds in action. So there's one where there's a, 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 an image, an animated image of what happens when you say a certain sound. And this is words, vowels, and consonants. There's another image where it's actually done with an MRI. So you watch the person sing and see what's going on. And then there's the images of where, or the sounds, where you can click on the, the sound, the IPA sound, and it will sound on what that's supposed to do. So what it does is it gives you three or four different ways of looking at the sounds. And to me, I, I'm, I'm a freak about this stuff. I love learning. And, as, and trying to learn about these things, this kind of helped me with my choirs. Really helped, and it, it doesn't mean they need to know all this information. They don't. But you do, because you need to help them understand what is going on with their voice and what you want them to do. And just giving them some, some little tricks of the trade. So, constants in music, that's what we're about. The most important principle in defining both vowels and consonants is maintaining the legato line. Bel canto singing, the singing that we, we say that our teachers study, is really about maintaining the legato line. So the legato line, of course, is empowered by the fact that there's breath underneath it. And if we understand that, our job is to look at that music and to try and figure out how to create the least interruption in the sound so that the sound continues to move, and so that the air is moving, and that they're not having a problem. That was part of this. That was part of this, maintaining this, the amount of breath flow as they went up. Remember, we did that yesterday as well. Um, singers that fail to support the expiration or allow consonants to interrupt the airflow weaken the continuity of sound. In other words, again, this goes to the noise that if we interrupt the noise, it weakens that ability to contain and maintain the legato line. Consonant, whether voiced or unvoiced, need not play the villain to the heroic vowel. This is Richard Miller. He was a voice teacher. Um, and you can tell, and if you read any of Richard Miller, it's, it's really great. Um, but can serve as a beneficial agent in defining the vowel more plastically than would otherwise be possible where one continuous string of vowels to be sung. What he's saying is basically, don't make the, the consonant your hero, your, your villain. Use him. Use that consonant in your music making to make things happen. So we'll see if we can apply this as we go through here. Rapid movement from one vowel position to another. And I want you to remember this when I show you a piece of music where this works. Through the consonant to the following vowel. Neither the vowels affected by the consonant or consonant, uh, consonant, uh, <laughs> articulation. Consonants must have enough duration to possess under undeniable affinity. In other words, you want to be able to understand the text. It's not what we're trying to do. You want to understand the text. That's the difference between us and the band and the orchestra. We have 
the beauty and the challenge of making sure that the text can be understood. You know who are the best people at doing that? Musical theater people. Not only do they understand that they, that they have to communicate the texts, they also understand that they, need to under, that they need to give us a subtext. What's going on in the action? What's the motion under the action? It's not just singing the notes. It's far more than that. And yes, there's acting and all of that, but musical theater is not a bad place for us to be looking at for help. Okay? And they go and they do eight shows, physical shows a, a, a week, and they are, and they're not just the singing shows, they're also rehearsing. So it's, it's something to remember. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the concept complements the ballet. It needs to have shorter duration, but never be of less importance. We want to work on, uh, on the rhythmic framework. So let's take a minute and talk about Mr. Shaw. One e and the two e and the t e and the four e and the one e and the two e and the t e and the four e and the. Right? You remember that? Oh man, if you were around Mr. Shaw, that's all we did was count sing. And I had a choral director who loved to count sing. And it got really tiring. But what happens? You have rhythmically, you've got rhythmic clarity. If we only worry about the vowel, we lose the rhythmic clarity because it's the consonants that help us move this music forward. So we want to make sure that if we're saying, Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus. Notice, yes, Jesus. Where am I going? I'm moving it into the consonant. I'm not going, Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Now I'm using the consonants to make that move. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so if we're thinking in different ways, I don't have to deal with them as much on the vowel. That 38%, that I can deal with more of the 62, and I can create alignments. So we want to make sure that slightly before the point of the beat to permit the vowel to sound on the beat. In other words, the vowel has to sound on the beat, the consonants ahead of the beat. We've all heard that, right? That was graduate methods, or undergraduate methods 101. It was learning that process, and we've forgotten it. We've, we don't have it down yet. Every consonant must be slightly anticipated by the proper um, proper, excuse me, proper press preparation of the articulators. Articulators are where? They're right here. So this is the most important part of what we're doing, is what's going on right here. It's not about that, excuse me, vowel. It's not just the double consonants. Not just the double consonants. You know, I always remember that because it's German. Himmel, right, double M's. Uh, making sure they're there in the German language, especially. That's my native tongue. So that's where I grew up in that, in that, uh, in that sound. But uh, coming to this and looking at the English language, there is just so much that we need to spend a little bit of time on teaching our choirs. Um, vowel formations and articulations of consonant improves. Vowel uniformity, it gets better. Pitch accuracy, that word ensemble, blend, and, right, intonation. Articulation, enunciation and clarity of the text. Rhythmic precision, control of dynamic levels of the tone color. Uh, efficiency, use of breath management, and a better regulated support of tone. A better regulated support of tone. And optimal resonance potential for each uh, singer and, and the ensemble. Um, much in the way we did yesterday, some of this uh, changing of people to get the optimal sound and blend when we did the seating arrangements. Um, the same idea here is that when we have an understanding of what we're trying to do in our music making and test clarity, we can come at it from a different direction. We don't need to be talking about vowels. We can affect the change by the way we move through the music the same way we move people to affect blends or a more homogenous sound, right? Vowel modification. Ladies and 
gentlemen, here is one of my favorite statements. Pitches and vowels ring in different places. So what I mean by that is, physics teaches us that you can only have a vowel stay in the same shape for a very little time. So if you've got a passage where the vowel is going up a line, the mouth shape has to change. That's an acoustical phenomenon. You cannot change physics. It's why sopranos cannot and should not be asked to sing certain vowels in, in their area from about D on up. There has to be modification. It goes first to an A, uh, the schwa, and then it finally goes to the A. Uh. But the A uh does not need to be the A uh that they think it needs to be. It does not need to be that. It's just A. Uh, this is just relaxed. So what I do with my singers, here's a little guy. As we're going up, I have them put their finger right here. And I just go, ah. Uh, Just that kind of reminder just kind of helps them. Uh, right? So it's just this. But if you keep this solid, uh, Very careful of how much loud singing we use. 
Um, and loud is only in relationship to the sauce. So make sure that they stay there. I talk about the, the Mahler II symphony. And you sat forever, for an hour, and then you get up and you have to sing a cappella for 23 bars. And it starts at 5 Ps and goes up to 5 Fs. Um, it, it really is a, a great example. I say that there's everything from a whisper to bloodshed at the end. And I, I try to avoid blood. And getting blood as, as part of a choral experience is not what I want to do. So you've got to be aware of what is the range that they can sing. If you've got a choir that's, that's older, you don't want them to sing too loud. Because it's all brittle, right? All of this becomes brittle. We know that. We've got to keep that air moving throughout our lives. We want to also use uh, constant modification sometimes for expressive purposes. So that can be for text expression. So what are problematic consonants? Stop closes and laterals are what, they, what they're called. So it's the G, the K, the D, the B, the T, the L, the L. You know, you're, you're a lot of you from Texas, and you know what happens with the L? Yeah, you got that down. L. L. Or the A. Yeah. yeah. It, it's so wonderful what that does, and you've got to deal with that. And you're, you know, I remember Rod Eichmann, we were talking about an all state or a regional honor choir he did here, and he said, you know, the, the kid would come up to me at the beginning of the rehearsal and say, Dr. Rothenberger, can you tell me how to say this word Kyrie? Yeah. And then he got in there and he gave the down beams. Kyrie. You know, I mean, so it's that example of how we can help them a little bit in this process. But I always remember that story. Um, so, so, uh, solutions here are um, substituting fricative consonants, keeping the consonants for. I cannot tell you what that will do when you start to bring those consonants forward. So you can use those exercises. Right? You can put them into patterns. And you can make sure that they're feeling that breath right there. And then all, all of that, right? Which is all back here. So keep it forward. It'll also keep that air in the um, and we're trying to uh, avoid interrupting the airstream. We know that we have pitched consonants. The V, uh, the Z, the uh, sh, sh. I see my singers when we go, sing, sing, sing. You have to pitch the S. Sing, sing. My S is higher than it would be normally. That's my note. If I go, sing, it won't work. So if I tell them to pitch the consonants, sing, 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 it's hard to get it there. And I'm using the consonants. I, I use warm up sometimes if I want to get my choir to get the breath flow idea. I will ask them to sing um, uh, on a TH or a V the entire line, the hymn. What that's doing is that's keeping the air flowing. The other thing is the resonating space is remaining flexible. Because when you go, I have to change the resonating space. If I do it without the change in resonance space, does that. So in my warm-ups, I can bring that in. I can take that one line from a hymn, and I can bring that into this process, and I can ask them to make sure that they're getting this idea of keeping that space open and free. If, you, if it feels tight, it is. Keep it open. Keep it free. Um, I, I know that the sublevel pitches with the B, the D, the G, the K, the B, the T. Those are the s sounds I heard on that tape when I went through and said, oh my gosh, I need to figure out what to do with that in my, in my community college choir. Um, so we're trying to teach our singers to move through the consonants. Um, we talked about in, in, in diction and, and intelligence.
eligibility. It increases the uh, intensity range available to the singer. And we'll see this in practice in just a minute. Improves the legato and comfort level of the singer, and it aids in vocal production. That's what we're trying to do by substituting, perhaps, or changing some of the consonants. So here's an example. This is a David Cal piece, I Carry Your Heart. And in this example, uh, they said there's a pointer somewhere. Let's see if it works. It's supposed to, but it doesn't. So this is what the choir sees in this score. I carry your heart with me. Do you see that? If we change that, I carry your heart with me. You're looking at me puzzled. All I'm doing is shifting. The R is a problem, constant for us. Okay, especially some of us in the South. Okay, we know the R here. If I do your heart, I'm moving the R here onto the bottom note because what would happen? I carry your heart. I carry your heart. Your heart. I'm bringing the R this way, and I make heart with heart with heart with heart with me. Heart with me. Do you hear the difference? Think about what's happening where I'm placing that consonant. I'm moving, I'm shifting the consonant. I carry your heart with, right? I'm moving that a little bit. So here's what we've done. We've eliminated the first R. We've moved the R to the next word. We've eliminated the R and moved the T to the next word. Heart with. We've added U. You know the rule about W's, right? I, if it has a W, it's, it's, it's in the front, and it's only W. It always has an U in front of it. If it's WH, like the word which, you put an H in front of it. That, that's just a standard diction rule that will help you and help your choir. And think about that for just a minute. Which, which, who, would, would, would. There's a difference in the way we use those sounds. If we use an H in front of a WH, you'll always have it right in the H. If you use an O in front of an O W, you'll have some help with that sound, getting that sound with the lips. What happens to our singers so often is the W goes this way, doesn't it? It goes wide, if you will. It's kind of like the FSU against the Miami games where they would always miss the target of the last game. Sorry, I had to bring that one in. <laughs> Wait, why? So uh, here we want which who 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 would who would. Now I'm bringing these corners in a little bit, and I'm allowing that sound with that sound of that that semi vowel or uh, in front of that little, or vowel in the one case. So let's take this a little further. Here's the next phrase, I carry it in my heart, I am never without it. So we again cross out the R, and I have my choir do this. I actually ask them, or sometimes I will mark my score, hand it to the choir, say, please take time to do this. Now that's a collegiate setting, I didn't do that to my church choir, I just said, bring this T, put this T, put it right there, do it this way. And here again, we notice that we've shifted it with, right? It in the my, in the my. I'm putting these two concepts right here. It in my heart. Does that, am I clear with what I'm doing right here? Do you see how this works? We're limiting for star. We move the two T again because there's a descending line. Descending line, and we don't want to have a scoop there. So if we did carry it in, carry it in, carry it in, carry it in, I'm sorry, carry it in my, or, so I'm, I'm using double consonants, I'm taking time to put 
double consent right there. Heart in, again, so we have this. I am never. Do you see how this works? Are you puzzled? Is this too much time to take in a service, in a rehearsal period? Sometimes it is. Sometimes you've got to quickly do it, but if you can teach it in the beginning and start it as part of your process and start it as part of rudimentary teaching, a change of teaching, yes? I would probably do a double T then and a stop. So carry it to, carry it to. It does. Well, we were all here yesterday, maybe for the, the high school concert. Really fine group, a summer group that's put together. I, I don't want to, but there was something about the way they always released the tea. Okay? So the tea was always louder than the line that preceded it, and that was to make sure they got off. And my sense is that any time we make the constant more important than the word, that it's, it's an issue for me as, as a sing as a listener. So he was being very particular, and it was really good choir singing. I mean, when you consider those kids were together what, for a week or two and put that together and sang that program, memorized, uh, you know, that's something that's remarkable. But that final T so often was overemphasized. And it's also a stop. And if you do that, you do that as hard as I just did it, ready, go. Feel what happens in your voice right here. Do it again. Ready? Go. It's, it's a grab, isn't it? It goes like this. You want to avoid that. You want to make it... T -t 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 -t. And if you do that, then you've got the release of the air at the end. That T also has a downward pitch. T -t -t. Okay, so with my choir, I practice constants at the end, and I have them do this. Heart. Do that for me. Ready? Go. Heart. And I leave my mouth open at the end. Try it again. Ready? Go. Heart. So the pitch is going this way rather than stop. Because the music doesn't do that. Music is created in silence. Music is created in the rest, and I try to teach the choir that that becomes part of the process, so that release is as important as anything. Yeah, so they can, they can come back. We can use that memory of being a child and singing simply, and really enhance our choir. Uh, some of the stuff yesterday in that first session, reading session that I was in, uh, there were some really beautiful lyrical things that we could do, but if we added weight to it, or shall we say experience of 80 years or 60 years to it, it could become problematic. So I can say to my choir at times, I want you to see this if you were just a child. It's why I go back to the things you warn us about. Seuss, Dr. Seuss, or going to the grounds like, you know, uh, we did Michael Road, the boat ashore, or, or we're sitting merrily, merrily down. Those sight things can help us as singers. I'm almost going to be out of time here. Um, so I go on through this. I want to see if I can get to, You'll see how this all works. Here's an example of how the soprano puts the ML there because they're moving in, there's motion going. O ends in L. So you're saying only, so the E occurs here while the basses are going only, only, but here there's movement, only, so we want to have the E on the top, so we're putting the constant there, Let's see if I can get to my rules here. But I've done this for this entire work. Oh, here's one. No. Think about what the singer does on the W sound at the end of a word. Nose. Nose. I just change it so 
I think that done you out. And I just asked him, eliminate the W, just keep it on the O vowel, and then close it on the Z sound. And it's something, you've got words in your, in your hymns, but more importantly in your anthems, with that word, O-W, at the end. And you've got to be aware of that. So, this is the exaggerated or the larger volume here is again where we've got differences in between where to put the mind here. I'm using mind can, mind can. I don't want to go mind can, right? Do you understand? This is in the soprano part. So the word is or mind can. And I'm just taking this, putting the D down, it's because I sang through it, and I said, mind can, mind can. Instead of mind can. So I've made some determinations. And here I've done it differently than the men. So they're doing mind can because they're on repeated notes and there's no change in pitch. These will always change some things. Precision. This is again, you have to ask your basses and your lower voices in general to have more articulation than the higher voices. It's easier for them to do. That's one of the things that you can get going in your choir. If it's a homophonic piece, make sure that the lower voices are giving you more articulation. It'll become imperative when you're trying to make sure the text intelligibility is there. You have to be more flexible with the higher voices. You just have to. You've got to do substitutions or changes so that the breath flow isn't interrupted. If you don't do that, you get that soprano sound you don't want, or tenor sound that you don't want. You know, the one I'm talking about. Okay? Music in the body, I'm going to keep going here just a little bit. Raise the soft palate, raise the eyebrows, smile when you sing. All of those things are doing the exact opposite of what you're hoping to change. You're trying to find this easy solution to a tougher problem. And it does nothing but exacerbate the, the problem that you have. So these are things that we cannot use. It doesn't help. Here, raise your eyebrows. I don't have any. Do it again. What happens right down here? You raise your eyebrows. Now don't think about yourself. Think about your sink. You say, raise the eyebrows. They want to please you. What do they do? They raise those eyebrows up there. And it's all attached right here. And so you've got literature, and this moves up. And now you've created plus two, and you're not helping the problem at all. So that smile when you sing, I had a voice teacher at the at, uh, at University of Miami, I loved the woman. Great, great teacher, except for her sopranos, because she had them stretch the pillars. That was to take this, the sides and to open it, so what happens is the, the basic sound comes here and it becomes so brittle. I could have one soprano and 50 other singers and it could be on that one soprano. It's kind of like a trumpet in a, in a choir. You know, it's, it can outdo all of us. We do funky things with our mouth in an attempt to make our voices sound bigger and stronger. Practice it infuses extraneous motion or body tension here. And so what we get, we see facial tension, Stop a breath. Artificial resonating space. That's raise the soft palate. Sure, raise the soft palate. Let's think about what that does. Your soft palate is back here. If we bring the soft palate up artificially, what's happening is the tongue creates the tongue moves back as well. When the first statement was made, it was made by uh, William Bernard, and he talked about the start, the onset of a yawn, the start of a yawn, okay, the surprise. But the surprise is not back here. It's just that, right? So that is keeping where the tongue stays flat. This is a little elevated. I'm not saying it's not there for classical singing. It's more so for classical singing. But we're not dealing with classical singers. We're dealing with people on a daily basis who have less training than we do, who are looking to us for leadership, and you may be the only voice teacher they've ever had, or ever will have. 
So we need to teach them easy fixes that make them lifelong seniors. My whole thing is about lifelong seniors. I want that kid in my children's choir to remain singing the rest of his life or her life and be able to sing all the way through until death. And there's Alzheimer's choirs. You know, we have prison choirs. We have choirs in all different walks of life. At the, unit, at the school I taught with my first community college job that I had, we had uh, eight uh, senior citizens choirs at our campus. Eight senior citizens choirs. And it was the most important part of our, our mission at that school was to make sure that we may address their needs. Because we had a very aging population at Long Beach at the time. When we use soft power, we want it to be elevated slightly. But we don't want to talk about it. We want it to happen. The minute we put the motion you know, or the idea into their head to raise the soft power, Yawn. That creates further tension. So William Bernard's thing was take a breath. They started yawn. And it's at, at the very start, it isn't at the completion of yawn. And so a lot of us got into that, which is again tension here as well. I, I don't know if you call it. Always put your vocal production in front, don't put it in back. You'll always have better intonation. You'll always have that intonation. Abdominal tension results in stronger sound due to, due to over abducted vocal cords. Whenever we get tense here, yeah, it's going to sound bigger, but it's not natural. And if I'm working with a 30 year old, or an 18 year old, or an 80 year old, that's not a good thing. It's let the voice be the voice that it is. I want to hear this. I don't want to hear the same singer come out of the studio. I want to hear various people who's well built differently. God makes us in these wonderful shapes and sizes. And when we understand that, that means that every voice should sound somewhat different. Um, stiffening muscles when singing uh, inhibits airflow. Uh, what most people feel is support. They support the sound, it's really more about sublevel pressure, again, getting that weight to it. Um, support always is a word I don't use. I don't want to use support because they don't understand it, and the only thing that they do is they use tension. Um, and singers need to just feel airflow. Airflow, airflow, airflow. Healthy singing is not stiff or stayed, it lets go of stability, usually uh, leads to the any type of stability leads to stagnation. Vowels and pitches ring in different changing spaces. Static body, static sound, and static breath are all interlinked. Flexible body, flexible breath, flexible sound. That's what we want. Okay? And you know all the standard things. Basis. Tannic. Sopranos. Yeah, what is going to do something? And basically, this is going to be lower pitches, I guess. Um, so there's that, and then the mouth tells I have to figure out what they do. But they're all really sopranos. I'm out of time. I, I apologize. I will put this up, and you can go to, the, to my website and just check it out. Thank